Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael McGinnis, uh, Executive Officer of the National Academy of Medicine. And it, it's my great pleasure to join with my uh, colleague, Dr. Karen Howard from the US uh, Government Accountability Office to welcome you all to uh, today's webinar uh, on the issue of artificial intelligence uh, in healthcare. Uh, we are very pleased to be able to uh, join with our colleagues at the uh, Government Accountability Office in this respect. It's uh, very much in the spirit of what we heard yesterday in, in a virtual inauguration that was uh, uh, highly effective uh, in uh, using our digital technology and uh, linking people around the, uh, the country and indeed around the world uh, in uh, an important experience for our nation. And the theme that the president uh, emphasized was unity and in the spirit of synergy and unity, uh, the National Academy of Medicine and the uh, Government Accountability Office have joined uh, to bring you this uh, webinar. Uh, the webinar uh, uh, will be divided into two parts. Uh, the first part uh, will focus uh, on GAO's activities uh, in technology assessment and specifically on artificial intelligence and healthcare, benefits and challenges of technology to augment patient care. Uh, and the second part will be uh, conducted by the National Academy of Medicine, uh, artificial intelligence and health settings outside uh, the hospital and clinic. Uh, and I'll just take a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit at the National Academy about the National Academy of Medicine and then turn it over to uh, Dr. Howard uh, for, uh, to, to lead us into the, uh, uh, the conversation that will uh, be first focusing on the GAO. The National Academy of Medicine uh, is one of the three national academies that work together under the 1863 charter of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, a charter which was um, signed by President Lincoln, um, a charter which was requested by President Lincoln in order to bring together the best scientific advice uh, possible uh, for a series of uh, difficult challenges uh, that were confronting the nation at that time. Uh, the uh, Academy expanded its uh, uh, focus of activity and not only in terms of the content involved and the frequency and with which uh, studies were requested by uh, the various administrations uh, uh, following uh, uh, President Lincoln's. Uh, and in uh, 1916, we formed the National Research Council uh, in order to keep a standing operating activity in place. And we all hope that you'll get a chance to, uh, when you visit Washington to visit our building, uh, which was built at that time uh, on the mall near the Lincoln Memorial. Um, in uh, 1964, we added the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, and uh, in 1970, we added the Institute of Medicine, which is now the National Academy of Medicine. Our job in the National Academy of Medicine is fairly straightforward, and that is to uh, provide the facts and the evidence and the science uh, related to uh, medicine, healthcare, uh, and biomedical uh, health, uh, public health, and biomedical science, uh, and to uh, work to help the administration and the nation uh, identify and enhance uh, productivity at the frontiers of uh, health, healthcare, and biomedical science. The uh, component of the National Academy of Medicine, which uh, has been most involved in uh, the work that uh, is cooperative uh, between GAO and NAM today, uh, is the work of the National Acad Academy of Medicine's Leadership Consortium uh, for a value and science-driven health system, which operates with four pillars of focus. One is science and evidence, the second is the digital infrastructure. A third is uh, payment and value. And a fourth is culture uh, and equity, uh, all of which are obviously interacted and all of which we've seen are fundamentally important Where? for progress um, 
over the past uh, the year in which we've been contending with the COVID uh, pandemic. So uh, the issue that we're discussing today, um, the focus on the role in the future of artificial intelligence in health and healthcare is of central importance to us at the National Academy of Medicine as it is to the nation. Uh, and uh, we're very pleased, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to be joined with uh, the Government Accountability Office uh, in uh, the efforts to uh, expand our nation's capacity in that respect. Before I turn it over to Karen Howard, I wanna give special thanks to uh, Stanford University and the Stanford uh, University School of Medicine, and in particular, Dr. Sunu Thadani Israni uh, of the Stanford University School of Medicine who have uh, worked uh, with us to ensure that uh, CME credit is provided for participation in today's webinar. So again, with uh, many thanks to all of you for joining, uh, with obviously special thanks to our uh, panelists and participants who have who you'll be hearing from and who've done the work uh, that we're going to be describing uh, today. I'll turn it over to Dr. Karen Howard, who's the Director of Science Technology and Analysis at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Karen. Thank you, Dr. McGinnis. As uh, Michael mentioned, I am Karen Howard. I'm a director at the U.S. Government Accountability Office, or GAO. For those who might not be familiar with GAO, we are a legislative branch agency that is whose mission is to support Congress in fulfilling its responsibilities. And we are as an agency celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. When we started back in 1921, we were the general accounting office and the purpose of the agency was to basically audit the books and expenditures of the federal government. That was the mission of GAO for the first 50 or so years. But beginning in the 70s, the purview of GAO expanded to performance audits, where we uh, conducted oversight of all of the activities of the federal government in, in all possible realms that you can imagine. And uh, more recently, providing more foresight work and insight for the Congress to assist in understanding the, the rapid change that's going on in our society today. As Michael mentioned, we have been partnering with the National Academy of Medicine on a three-part series on AI and healthcare. The first of these reports was issued in December 2019, and it focused on AI and drug development. The second one is the one we're here to talk about today, and it focuses on AI technologies to augment patient care. And the third one is just getting underway. It will be hopefully issued by the end of calendar year 2021, and it is focused on AI and medical diagnostics. I'd like to thank the National Academy of Medicine for this very fruitful partnership. We have enjoyed it very much. It has enriched and enhanced our work in countless ways. Also, I'd like to thank the group of experts that came together with us to help us do this work and to ensure the, the accuracy and the relevance of this work to the medical and the technology communities. Uh, a few of these experts are joining us today as panelists, so you'll have the opportunity to hear from them uh, firsthand. And with that, we'll turn to part one of the webinar. So as you can see, just as an overview, I'm gonna give a very brief introduction to the report that GAO put together in, in coordination with the National Academy of Medicine on AI and healthcare benefits and challenges of technologies to augment patient care. I'll obviously not be able to cover everything that's in the report, but hopefully hit some key highlights and whet your appetite to uh, turn to the report itself, which is fully available in the public sphere. And then I'll be handing, oh, handing the presentation over to John Manaster, who will introduce our panelists and moderate the panel discussion and the Q&A. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide just sets up the title of the report again. And next slide. As I mentioned earlier, the Government Accountability Office does support Congress in its role. And we are organized as an agency into mission teams. Each is focused on a particular area of the federal enterprise, things such as defense, healthcare, international affairs and trade, and so on. My team is the Science, Technology Assessment and Analytics Team, or STAA, as we call it. And as you might imagine, with a name like that, we focus on science and technology and provide insight and foresight for the Congress so that it can better understand the many technological changes that are going on in our world today. We provide this insight in several ways. Next slide, please. One of these is our group of science and tech spotlights. And these are 
two page explainers on a given topic that aim to provide an understandable quick introduction to the topic, something that anybody with no science background could read and gain a better understanding of the topic. And as you see, a couple of them are pictured there, one on coronaviruses that we issued in March, one on contact tracing apps that we issued over the summer and several others listed down the right hand side that are related to the health and medical fields. And we have a number of these in non-medical fields as well. Next slide, please. Another way that we assist Congress with understanding science and technology issues is through reports that we call technology assessments. These reports are a deep dive into a technology or a set of technologies where we are trying to explain what the technologies are and how they work, what the potential benefits are that those technologies may bring as they're developed and implemented, and what challenges might uh, be encountered in implementing those technologies, and then options that policymakers could consider to help enhance the benefits and mitigate the challenges. This slide shows a few of our recent health and medical related technology assessments. The one on the left is the artificial intelligence in drug development report that we issued in November of 2019, the first in the series with the National Academy of Medicine. The second is on multiplex point of care assays for infectious diseases. Uh, the third one is one that we issued this past summer on COVID-19 data quality and modeling. And the fourth one, next slide please, is the one that we're here to look at today, to talk about today, artificial intelligence in healthcare to augment patient care. And you can see the report number up there, GAO21-7SP. You can use that to search online and find the report. Next slide, please. So in this report, we took a look at a suite of technologies that can assist clinicians in uh, a variety of ways to augment patient care. And you can see here, we divided those applications, those tools, all of which are based on machine learning into two main categories. In the orange categories at the top, we look at clinical applications where you'll find tools that can support population health management, for example, looking for trends across the population, monitoring individual patients, guiding surgical care, predicting health trajectories and recommending treatments. And then we also looked at a category of technologies in the blue section of this graphic that can help automate laborious tasks record digital clinical notes and optimize operational processes. And in each case in the report, again, I'm just giving you the highlights, but there are detailed examples of these technologies, how they work, what some of their benefits are and so on. Next slide, please. We do always in these technology assessments, look at the potential benefits that society and industry could reap from these technologies. And in this report, these fell into three main categories. The first is improving treatment, of course, for patients, which is a primary goal. The second is increasing resource efficiency, including the use of staff time. And the third is reducing provider burden. Again, the report itself contains many examples of how these technologies are able to reap these benefits or have the potential to reap these benefits for those that are still in development. Next slide, please. We also looked at the challenges to using AI tools to augment patient care. And we found that there were, uh, in our assessment, six primary buckets of challenges. Many of these will be familiar to those of you who have worked in the sphere of artificial intelligence before. One of them, the first one, is difficulties with accessing high quality data. Of course, AI only works if you have massive amounts of data to train the algorithms. So there are often difficulties in accessing enough data to do high quality training processes with the algorithms. Second is potential bias in data. In this case, in this field of healthcare, the data are of course biased toward those who are most commonly accessing the healthcare system or have the greatest access, particularly in the private sector. So that puts an inherent bias in the data, the, the bias uh, toward those who have access to, to healthcare, particularly in the private sector. Third is difficulties in scaling. AI tools that are developed in one location, for instance, in, within one medical system might work perfectly well in that system, but when you move them to a different system, perhaps uh, from an urban setting to a rural setting or from a smaller health system to a larger one, they might not scale well to a different setting. And sometimes even tools that were developed in a city medical system uh, can't transition well to another city medical system because the culture in the new city is different and the healthcare system is set up and works differently. So that creates challenges as well. Next slide, please. 
Three additional challenges. The uh, fourth one is limited transparency of AI tools. And again, if you're familiar with the AI space, you know that one of the common concerns is whether the tools can be interpreted and explained appropriately. That's very difficult to do when you have a tool that's finding its own patterns in the data and then using those patterns and applying them to new data, to new patients, for example, and their condition. It's very difficult to understand how the tool is doing that or to explain it. Fifth, there are difficulties with protecting patient privacy. Of course, in, in AI for healthcare, the data that you're drawing from are healthcare data, claims data and uh, medical records and so on. And it's very important to protect patient privacy, but that can hamper the development of AI tools. And last, there is uncertainty about liability for AI tools. This is just a relatively new field that hasn't had a lot of um, court activity yet. So there haven't been a lot of decisions handed down. If an AI tool makes a mistake, who's liable for that? Is it the technology developer? Is it the software programmer? Is it the clinician who uses the tool? These are questions that haven't yet been answered yet because there haven't been sufficient cases to test this in much detail. Next slide, please. And with those challenges and benefits, we always present policy options. And in order to understand this, next slide, please. I first want to explain how GAO defines policymakers. And of course, since we're a legislative branch federal agency that works for Congress, that's where the mind immediately goes, that these are suggestions for Congress, and that's true. But we view policymakers more broadly. We include uh, federal and state governments, uh, federal executive branch agencies, academic and research institutions, and industry, which of course in this case is the medical system and clinicians within that system. So policymakers for us is very broad. Next slide, please. When we present policy options, we view these as a menu of options, not exhaustive, but some ideas that could help the, that wide ranging group of policymakers enhance the benefits of the technologies and mitigate the challenges that the technologies might pose. So uh, as you look at these kind of think along those lines, and we grouped our policy options for this particular report into six buckets. The first is collaboration. Uh, there was a, a great deal of evidence indicating that interdisciplinary collaboration between technology developers and healthcare providers was uh, not as strong as it could be, which made the tools perhaps less useful than they might otherwise be. Second category is data access, a variety of suggestions that we made and uh, elaborated on in the report for how to develop or expand high quality data access mechanisms. Third is best practices. It would be very helpful to establish best practices across the stakeholder community for the development, implementation, and use of AI in the healthcare field. Fourth is interdisciplinary education. Uh, healthcare workers might have concerns about, can I trust this AI tool or how do I properly use it? Because they're not, in most cases, technology developers. They, they may not understand the AI platform. They may not understand the software that's written underneath it and the decisions that it's producing can then be questioned. So an interdisciplinary education to allow them to better interpret and understand the AI tools would be helpful. Fifth is oversight clarity, again, to address this question about how are these tools being regulated, how might they be regulated in the future, and uh, where might legal liability fall into the picture. And last, we always take a look at the status quo, because that's always an option. It's just to let the current system proceed as it has been and uh, try to enhance the benefits and mitigate the challenges on its own. So again, this is just an overview. There's a more detailed analysis in the report but these are the kinds of policy options we presented for consideration. Next slide, please. And with that, I would like to turn it over to John Manaster, who is a senior analyst at GAO and was the project leader on this study. He'll be introducing our panelists and moderating the discussion. John? Thanks so much, Karen. So again, I'm John Manaster. I'm a senior analyst of the Government Accountability Office. I led the GAO report along with many great colleagues. Today, I'm really honored to have three of our GAO experts we consulted with while working on the report here to speak with us about the state of AI and healthcare. So to get us going, I'm gonna introduce each of our participants. We'll have them all turn their cameras on and the four of us will have a great conversation. Um, so we can have a slide up. Thanks. So first I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Sendak, the population health and data science lead at the Duke Institute for Health Innovation where he helps lead interdisciplinary teams to build technologies that solve real clinical problems. Next, we have Marzier Kasimi, 
an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in computer science and medicine, who has a well-established academic track record and personal research contributions across computer science and clinical venues. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Oznan Mareli, who is a practicing surgeon at the Massachusetts General Hospital, an assistant professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School, and a co-founding director of the Surgical Artificial Intelligence and Innovation Laboratory. So we can have a slide down and panelists, please go ahead and turn your cameras on and thanks so much for, for joining today. All right, is everyone, uh, so I'll say hello. I'll just go around here. Hello, Marzier. Hi. Thanks for joining. Hello, Mark. Mark's, you're on mute. Um, and hello, Oz. Hey, John. Hi, everybody. Hey. Sorry, I'm, I sh should be vocal now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sounds good. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to talk with the three of you. You were really helpful in making the report happen. You know, we had an expert meeting and the three of you were able to participate and, and we really appreciate that. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of kick the discussion off uh, while we're talking, anyone in the webinar is welcome to use the Zoom Q&A button and, uh, and ask questions, but we'll also have some initial questions, some discussion time, and then at the end, we'll move into a more formal question and answer period. So Oz, you were introduced last, so I'll, I'll uh, check in with you first here. So you're the co-founder and director of the Surgical Artificial Intelligence Innovation Laboratory at MassGen. So maybe just tell us a little bit about what you do there and, and why you felt it was so important to create SAIL. And definitely, thanks for the question, John. So uh, what do I do at SAIL, right? So I'm the director of the laboratory and um, I have uh, a bunch of uh, PhDs, uh, you know, under my direction there and then my guidance uh, mentorship as well. They are both uh, surgical residents in the middle of their uh, surgical residency training and also PhDs from, uh, you know, from uh, many computer science uh, folks in computer vision. And uh, that's a, a co-appointment with MIT and Mass General and uh, they are also under the guidance of Daniela Russ from CSAO and MIT. Uh, besides that, we also have different branches within SAIL where we have our associate director uh, for research is Daniel Hashimoto and our associate director for engineer is Guy Rosman, uh, who also spent some time at the Toyota Research Institute of Autonomous Vehicles. Uh, SAIL was uh, created, we felt that it was necessary to create something like this because back at six years ago, when we started just working across the, the river with MIT, about trying to investigate how could we make surgery better, especially using one thing that we have that's quite preeminent in surgery, which is the vision. When we do minimally invasive surgery, laparoscopy and robotic surgeries and endoscopy, we have a stable view uh, of uh, image that's being shared across all the other screens. That gave us a huge opportunity to leverage computer vision to try to understand not just a single still image, but that image over time. So then having the temporal component and the, the spatial component, we decided to research how computer vision and machine learning could influence on that. Because there was a need to have a house, a home for all or those like-minded uh, people, both surgeons and engineers to exist. And there was not such a thing like in the United States at the moment, we decided to create that at Mass General. Going back to the whole uh, history of innovation that our hospital has, many of our surgeons are also engineers. Uh, our former chair was an engineer in, in cardiothoracic as well. So we founded that. And since then, we've been able to not just foster collaboration within Mass General, but with Mass General MIT and other institutions in the United States, Canada, in Europe, and Japan as well. So the idea is that one is education is the first component. So we wanna train those, those engineers and, sur and surgeons to go back to the market and, and take this mission forward. The second one is research, right? We have a few grants, both uh, for peer review grants and uh, sponsor research agreements from engineer to develop products to be meaningful. And finally, also we engage with uh, societies such as SADIS, uh, American College and others to help uh, bring this idea and create uh, policies and regulations on how to uh, thoughtfully implement all those uh, developments. So it's kind of broad, uh, but that's pretty much what is what we do at SAIL, what is SAIL. Yeah, you're keeping yourself busy there. That all yes, sounds for really, sure. Yeah, that all sounds really interesting. Yeah, um, I pretty so, much spend like uh, half of my time like doing surgeries and the other half of the time, you know, running this, uh, this enterprise. Yeah, you're a busy guy. 
Um, and so you're really involved in a lot, you know, you're kind of plugged in all over the place here with, with a lot of different aspects of AI, especially as it, you know, connects with your work. So maybe a good follow up there is, you know, kind of where are you seeing AI provide the most value right now? What are you most excited about? Yeah, so I say at the moment, right, right now for surgery, I think that the best value that AI provides, the same value that provides for other parts and, and healthcare, which is pretty much like leveraging natural language processing and, you know, machine learning to try to really dig in big data. But what I, what I see that's going to be unique for surgery is the fact that uh, soon you're going to be able to start having some inferences that are going to provide us with like a real-time, you know, um, augmentation of our cognitive capabilities, pretty much like help us how to do surgery better or either to make a procedure better and either to make a procedure safer. Is that almost having like a second pair of eyes with us in the operating room? Once we get to that level, we can only imagine where we could potentially go. And especially if you can actually leverage, uh, you know, the, the beauty of machine learning and artificial intelligence is that, that we all can learn at the same time. If I'm doing one surgery, I learn at once and I have to, you know, sleep and rest and I'm learning next day again. But imagine if all the surgeons in the world would be able to share their knowledge and create this common conscious that we call the collective social consciousness, where we're going to be able to, to tap in our of their, uh, you know, triumph and our of their mistakes and just make the field better, you know, exponentially every day for all of us using a system such as this. That sounds great. I like that idea of a, of a collective uh, consciousness of, of all the different surgeons coming together. Um, all right, well, let's let's uh, talk to Marzier. So Marzier, I, I know you, you've got a lot going on as well. So uh, just quickly to kick things off, maybe talk a little bit about, a little bit about your work with ICU Intervene and, and some of the ICU work you've done and you know, kind of what you've learned from creating that, that particular tool. Sure, I think uh, for me as a computer scientist who started collaborating closely with uh, ICU doctors and intensivists during my PhD, uh, really what I learned is that uh, the ICU is a very data heavy environment, which is good for uh, deep learning algorithms, right? Because you have, you know, many inputs you could look at and many potential outputs that you could predict, like does somebody need a ventilator? Does somebody need a vasopressor? What kind of vasopressor? Um, but it's also a very biased environment, meaning we uh, really, we send you to the ICU when you're very sick and we have the most data on you in the ICU when you are the very sickest. And so I think some of what I have learned when working with hospital data is you have to control very heavily for the confounded nature of, of health, right? Because you don't have a lot of healthy examples and often you're uh, good at predicting the sickest of the sick because that's who you have the most data on. Um, I think focusing on ICU is, is where a lot of people in machine learning have started because that's where a lot of the resources are. But I've seen an expansion out to other hospital environments where now we're looking at general internal medicine, we're looking at surgical site, right? I think that that kind of gradual expansion to whole hospital understanding of healthcare as a process is very important for machine learning. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so for you, you know, you worked on your, the ICU Intervene project. What are you working on right now? Maybe share a little bit about some of the stuff that you've worked on lately and, and what's exciting you. I, I think what's exciting is uh, I, uh, during my PhD, I really wanted to establish whether we could predict important clinical events like the need for an intervention with high fidelity. And I, I feel like we've established that. You can actually. And now, uh, now we're looking at, in my lab, all of those questions that, uh, that Karen actually highlighted, right? Great, you can predict it in one setting. Can you predict it in another setting? Are there ways to, on the model side, try to make your model more robust when it hasn't seen data from another site? Are there ways to make it more fair when it's been trained in an environment like Boston where we have really small minority populations and then try to extend it to other places that are more diverse? Can we make it uh, you know, more private without losing a lot of the accuracy in small minority settings? So those are the kinds of things we're trying to think about. Not just can you train a really accurate high fidelity model, but can you make it robust, private, and fair? Sure, those are all the, all the important things, uh, all, the, all the tricky parts that are, try, are trying to come together here. Um, so Mark, for you, um, I know you're also, again, uh, involved in a lot, that's why you three are really great people to speak with about this. So many irons in the fire. 
Um, so one of the things that uh, I know that you worked on was uh, was sepsis, and you know sepsis is of course a huge problem across the country. So maybe tell us a little bit about Sepsis Watch and and how that got developed and and kind of rolled out. Yeah, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> One thing too, I I look back now and I almost view it like having kids, where you have like the pre kid life and then the post kid life. So my work on sepsis was part of my pre COVID life. So um, my team, the Duke Institute for Health Innovation, we are situated under the CEO of the health system, but many of us also have appointments in the School of Medicine, but our positioning helps us stay very operationally focused. So the way that we identify the problems that we tackle is we work with our senior leadership to identify strategic priorities, typically four or five priorities every year. They can be broad statements like provider well-being, hospital safety, hospital acquired infections. So the, the year that we started working on sepsis was 2016. There was a call for proposals related to inpatient safety. One of our hospitalists, QI leaders for inpatient care submitted the concept of using big data machine learning to improve the way that we were detecting sepsis. Historically, we had implemented our electronic health record EPIC back in 2013. We had implemented what was called a best practice advisory. This is a type of pop-up that's rules-based in our emergency departments to flag patients who had become septic. And this type of configuration really drove people crazy. It was the classic alarm fatigue story. We published a paper, I think in 2018, 19, 86% of the alerts were canceled. For certain patients, it was firing up to 100 times a day because every time you logged onto a different computer, it would refire. I see Marzia's face. And yes, that was the face of every provider. So the, since then, there's been a decree in all of IT work of like, we have a really high bar to do pop-ups in the EHR. That was while we were still learning about the reality of alarm fatigue. So um, ironically, it took a really long time to turn that off. One thing you will see in healthcare is we are very bad at de-innovating. So there's a lot of inertia once you put something into practice to actually take it out of practice. So um, we already knew it wasn't working in 2016. So our frontline staff proposed to build better technology to identify folks. And a huge part of the workflow was also we needed to route alerts to a team that was not at the front lines. Our frontline providers are very overwhelmed under a lot of stress. At our flagship hospital, we have about 200 ED visits a, a day typically long wait times in the waiting room. So there's already a lot of things coming at folks. So we set up this team, now it's called a patient response team, but originally it was the first proactive use of the rapid response team. So RRTs emerged in the early 2000s in response to patient safety complaints and really the Institutes for Health Improvement did a big push around 100,000 lives saved. So the idea was that anybody in a hospital should be able to kind of pull a string or push a button and stop a process and call a team to come kind of evaluate the setting. This was inspired by Toyota and factory manufacturing. So you need to have procedures in place where anybody can be empowered to kind of call a team remotely to come respond to an emergency. So that was part of standard of care at Duke for several years, this rapid response team. But it was a very reactive role where they waited essentially until something bad was happening and then they would get activated and then run to that room. So sepsis watch was the first time we were trying to reconfigure this role to be more proactive. So we spent several years curating high quality data sets, doing retrospective prospective evaluations. I can point folks to the papers. It was part of a close collaborator's PhD developing the model and then many years of work to get it fully into practice in 2018. 
Now it's scaled to our three hospitals. We're scaling it to units outside of the emergency department. I will say in terms of um, generalizability, it's not just across institutions taking something from Duke to UNC eight miles down the road. It can even be taking something from one ED within the same health system to another ED or going from the emergency department to inpatient wards. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of time spent at the front lines, collaborating directly with frontline providers, understanding their workflows, designing the workflows. We typically do model design and development in, in parallel with workflow design and development. The technology has to be informed by the frontline staff and the problems that they're facing. So it's lots of stakeholder engagement, change management. I joke that the hardest parts of the work have nothing to do with technology. Getting anybody to do anything differently is hard. And in healthcare, we can be particularly stubborn about the workflows that we're used to. Yeah, yeah, definitely something we heard a lot about in the report. And you mentioned that you kind of have your pre and post COVID life. So, you know, maybe if you, if you want to just quickly highlight a project or two that you're working on in the post COVID world, um, we'd, we'd be happy to hear about that. Yeah, so our first machine learning projects were around population health management. So over the last decade, we've seen a lot of changes in healthcare that have changed the way health systems try to manage their populations. So in 2014, we were one of the early participants in a Medicare shared savings program. So this was Duke now getting paid to effectively manage chronic disease in a population of 50,000, 60,000 individuals. So that was an outpatient centered project, trying to identify progressing chronic kidney disease and intervene, refer folks for specialty care. So very much trying to look into the future and intervene on that set of patients. And we've continued to do work in that outpatient population, particularly Medicare beneficiaries over the age of 65 and folks who are local and plugged into care. And then we had kind of a whole portfolio of projects focused on the inpatient setting, sepsis being one of them. We have also since done adult ICU transfers, pediatric ICU transfers, and cardiac deterioration. And once again, once we started to design these workflows and reconfigure the roles, it was easier to conceptualize, okay, now if we do this, what about modules to do this other set of items? Because each of these has its own set of interventions attached to it. Okay, and then so COVID comes and we were pulled in in early March. It was the head of critical care at Duke who sent my team director an email. This was before any tests were even positive on the East Coast. And we kind of huddled and we said, okay, what are we gonna do to start preparing for this thing? So we started standing up, um, it's called ILI, influenza-like illness. So this is a broad term to look at anything this is what we were looking for before we were looking for COVID because no one even knew how to test for COVID. So we just started monitoring influenza-like illness. And then we started building um, remote monitoring systems so that a patient could register into a system and then they would get two texts a day, 8 a.m., 8 p.m., submit their symptoms. And then if there was anything concerning, we could route it to a nurse to, to call folks. I will say too, um, Everything post COVID has not been machine learning. This has been very basic technology, but the biggest learning for me this whole last year was how systematically excluded populations have been from healthcare. So we stood up a system the first week of April that was twice daily symptom monitoring available in English and Spanish with nurses making phone calls to anybody with severe symptoms with volunteers making phone calls to anyone who lapsed on their surveys. Fast forward to now 12,000 people have used the system. Over 90% of them are white. There was a period over the summer. Durham is in the South, North Carolina. 13% of our local population is Latinx. 87% of new infections were in the Latinx population. Our health record, our hospital website, our patient portal, nothing is available in Spanish. This is changing, but I mean, I think it was just such a reality check of 
the populations that are being hit hardest by these disease by this disease literally we were caught flat-footed so what we ended up doing we got out talking with the community meeting with community organizers faith-based communities community-based organizations quickly realized like people don't want to give Duke their data there's a lot of fear, ICE, there's concern of use for research, historical bias against participating in research for good reason. So we actually ended up licensing all of the technology and COVID policies outside of Duke, implementing this outside of Duke with support from our city county. You don't have to use your real name to participate in the system. You don't have to give your birthday minimal information. You can delete your record at any time. It's the type of very basic permission and governance controls that we never have had to really deal with working with an EHR. I typically like, I just go grab data that's there because it's there and there's no permissions to build a machine learning model. There's no like people can't delete their record. I mean, it can be a pain to even get your record. So these very basic things that you realize, oh, wow, the system was not built to engage folks who don't trust the system. But then when they're getting pummeled, you have to completely reimagine how you build the system. So to me, a, a big learning was being fortunate to be in a position to be flexible and be able to build new types of IT tools in different settings, public private partnerships. But the, the reality was none of the community health workers that are state funded were hired within Duke. So even from a personnel standpoint, they were hired within the faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, and then the technology systems that ended up reaching these communities were not Duke systems because we historically, that, that is not how the systems were designed or configured to put the needs of these individuals first. So to me, I, I look at data sets now in the EHR with a very, very different perspective than ever before. Yeah, thanks. Um, always a good thing to keep in mind. Um, so what I wanna do here before we turn it over to uh, some great Q&A questions that are always coming in, I wanna do a little little lightning round here with a, a couple other questions. So I'm gonna ask a question to each of you and just give me whatever comes to mind first here in response and uh, we'll see if we can have a little fun. So we talked, Karen talked about a lot of different challenges and we, in each of you have brought up a lot of different issues that are kind of standing in the way of moving this forward and, and, and really making this uh, work for the most people. So I'm just gonna kind of ask each of you, if, if someone came up to you and maybe a PhD, PhD student, new staff member and said, you know, I wanna work on something, you know, but I wanna, I wanna work on one thing, I wanna solve, you know, the biggest challenge, or I want to really try and help, you know, so what would you say is like the biggest challenge right now, if someone was was offering to tackle something for you? So Marzia, maybe I'll, I'll start with you. Um, the biggest technical challenge is finding uh, spaces where patients with similar health problems look similar. It's almost impossible, like it's an unsolved problem and it's very, very hard. You know, we, we know uh, how to work well with images because we use convolutional neural networks where things that are close in pixel space are also close in model space. We know how to work well with text data because we use recurrent neural networks where it, you conditionally generate words based on prior words that were stated because that's how the data actually exists, right? We can build models that have efficient com computation infrastructure to mimic how the data was created so that when they learn a representation, things that are similar are in a similar latent or hidden space. And we can't do that with health data because we haven't found good representations yet. And so I think finding representations where similar clinical presentation bubbles up to the similar latent space location would be amazing. Oz, how about you? Yeah, based on what Karen presented, I would say two things. One is the access to high quality data, but not just like uh, the large amount of data, but diverse data. Because it becomes a huge problem when we get sometimes what's happening in the industry, when I say industry, both academia and corporations, is the creation of silos. And then you build your own data set. And then you don't even want to disclose what you have as a data set. 
So how can we actually validate those? So for us researchers to be able to create something that's going to be, be able to extrapolate to different hospitals, to different settings, rural and urban, to different countries, is access to high quality, diverse data sets that can actually validate how good they are, where they come from. The second thing is the liability. I think that's going to be huge important, especially in healthcare, because when you say if an AI system made a recommendation for a surgeon or a clinician to do something and something goes wrong, right? Who is to blame, right? Who developed the system? Was the clinician who accepted that information? You know, or what do we need to do on those? That's going to be such a like a huge field of uh, discussions. And I think Marzi wants to comment on that. I just want to say the model will be wrong sometimes. Yeah. There's no way to have a perfect model. And so addressing the liability question, but also asking the question before that, which is, how do we build models so that when they are wrong, you're not so over-reliant on them that yeah. you think, it, I must be wrong, the model must be right, is something I've been worried about. You're absolutely right. And we discuss this internally all the time with the projects we're making. For example, one of the projects is the detection of the critical view of safety, which is a step of the operation of a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, when if you do it wrong, the complications are extremely high. But let's say if the machine makes a suggestion that I, as a surgeon, disagree. And even though there is a complication after that, you know, well, what was, was the patient's factors? I mean, could I be blamed because I didn't listen to the model? We should build like uh, some uh, systems that if there is a discrepancy between the AI and the clinician, maybe somebody just comes telemetry as a tiebreaker or something. But we should build those because people need to be comfortable about using those systems not to be like 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 a watchdog of the of the clinicians. I, yeah, say, I, I, th I think we're a great group because our answers are totally different. I will say last mile implementation, and I've seen this throughout my work in health innovation. There's a lot of great research coming up with new concepts, developing new concepts, but huge translational gap in terms of actually getting these things into practice, working with frontline staff to develop, implement workflows. So that's true on the in my pre-COVID work. So inpatient workflows, how to develop the notification systems, how to iterate on them, implementing the same system in multiple hospitals. We actually had different workflows in the different hospitals. Um, Post-COVID, I would say it was last mile implementation magnified immensely. So I'll tell you a story that to me has a lot of parallels with our work in machine learning because it's around how do you build confidence with uncertainty. So folks may be familiar with the concept of rapid antigen tests and cheap tests that are becoming more commonplace. So our federal government, HHS, purchased 150 million Abbott, Binax now rapid antigen tests. Those are now given to states and states are distributing those. So we're helping implement rapid antigen testing in a few local public schools. And so these are tests that are imperfect. And to Marzia's point, no model is perfect, but some are useful. No test is perfect, some are useful. So now there's a 20 page PDF. There's a two minute training video from the, the biotech company. And you have school principals being told now you need to use this test. So, <laughs> I mean, we worked with our clinical lab director to develop protocols. We actually took some tests. We couldn't even get our hands on these tests because they're not commercially available. They're purely in government contracts. So we're developing the training material, developing competency-based assessments to make sure that lay people with a high school diploma know how to use these tests, have quality control, develop the um, follow-up procedures. Do we need to get PCR testing afterwards? If there's a risk of, because the specifications are different in symptomatic versus asymptomatic in certain subgroups, do you want to increase the frequency because you can make an imperfect test more useful if you do it more frequently. So these basic concepts about it, it is probability, it is uncertainty, but having to build those capabilities in that last mile, whether the end, honestly, whether the end user is a physician or a high school teacher, like we should not be making assumptions about the statistical sophistication of our end user for using these tools. 
So to me, I think that's really a, a big part of the future because what's going to happen with COVID, and I think this is going to be a long-term thing, is that more and more types of non-healthcare providers will become healthcare consumers for innovations that they have to put into practice. And from what I'm seeing with small businesses and every school we talk to, there is a huge need for better ways to disseminate that expertise. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's turn to some Q&A here. And again, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom for everyone that's watching and type in your questions. So first, I'm going to take a question from Ryan, who asks, in general, in terms of market acceptance, would you say the general receptiveness by clinical professionals in adopting AI assistance is more on the eager side, or is it more on the skeptical side? How are all the various healthcare providers feeling about um, AI tools? Yeah, I can comment on that because we have been doing some internal like research here at Mass General to find out how what's the acceptance of uh, surgeons to have a second pair of eyes helping them to guide through surgery. And the answer, it depends. It depends which generation you're coming from because the very young residents in training, the ones who are very uh, involved with simulation, they're very eager and, and they were welcome to have something like that, you know, with them. The, the more established surgeons being practiced for like 20, 30 years plus, in general, they do not uh, like to have uh, anyone commenting on what they are doing in the procedures because uh, that's the nature of their culture. And something in between, which are like, uh, I would say evolving more close to the younger surgeons. Uh, a comparison I can make is like, for example, remember like uh, if you go back at, um, you know, three gener I mean, three decades ago, driving cars with no GPS, right? You gotta know the city, how you drive. Then now you add GPS and the younger generation who is whatever, you know, 21 years old driving right now, that person cannot drive without a GPS and ways to get you there. So it's kind of like, it is evolving. I was going to say, I, I can point people to, we published an analysis led by an amazing undergrad where he interviewed nurses and physicians. So both it varies by type of professional and it varies over time. So Definitely. the idea that you need support with your clinical decisions is not something that people like eagerly sign up for. I think something that we have observed is the value of personal feedback. So one of the things, this was like a utility we built out after we launched Sepsis Watch, but it's a feedback system where people get reports themselves for patients they cared for, whether the sepsis bundle was a failure, the items weren't delivered in time, whether it was a success, and whether the model accurately or inaccurately predicted for that patient. So every model is going to be wrong sometimes. But it's important for physicians to see when the model is right and when the model is wrong. And I think that you can drive more buy-in by, and that's also, um, we've written a lot about what transparency means and how effective transparency is for building trust. There's lots of different types of transparency. Transparency doesn't just mean explainability or interpretability. There can be other ways to, any type of feedback loop or insight you can give people into how something is working in practice when they use it, I think can be really helpful for people. So we've observed a lot more enthusiasm once we create more ways to share feedback and insights back with the folks on the ground. Thanks. And so I'm going to ask another one from Tavisa, who is, is asking, what happens after the use of an AI tool. So an AI tool does something and by doing something, it will probably generate some data. And what happens to that data afterwards? How is that data potentially used again? Is, there, is it fed back into the system in most cases? And how is the privacy of the patient protected with that new data? So uh, I can take this one for, uh, for many applications the kind of data that we store about you would be maintained in a new deployment. So let's say we have something that's alerting for uh, ventilation. You need to be ventilated, right? We're still going to record in the EHR decisions that were made, even if there's a new alert system, right? I think the issue is if we now feed that data back into the machine learning algorithm and then learn again from it, we could potentially be propagating errors that we're not aware of. Um, 
I think that we need a pretty hefty audit system for uh, decisions that are made pre and post deployments. I don't think that it's a it's a bad thing. I think it's like the the lovely GPS analogy, right? I don't know many people now who can just navigate around their city. We've become reliant on this tool. That tool means that we're lost a lot less and we can go a lot further, but it also means we've sort of lost this old capacity for exploring our city with some rough understanding of objects and landmarks. But I, as in terms of patient privacy, I'd like to say, I think patient privacy is um, often invoked by corporations, uh, rightly so, because they might be tying that identity to other information they have about the patient. I know you just got lap laparoscopic surgery. Maybe I should also sell you a diet plan, right? In the context of learning optimal treatments and trying to improve treatment availability, I don't think privacy uh, carries the same uh, maybe weight or burden because we're not tying it to other extra information about an individual's purchasing habits or their lifestyle. I want to add to that, Marty's great comments. I was going to say, this also brings another uh, problem that's what's the data ownership, right? It has become a very like, uh, you know, like hot topic. And sometimes you're almost like a scene as a hype. Who does the data belong? Does the data belong to the patient? Does it belong to the clinician? Does it belong to uh, the manufacturer? Or does it belong to the healthcare system? And, and I think the data wouldn't exist wasn't for the interaction of all of them together. It was for a surgeon operating on a patient with the device that was created by a company in a healthcare system to create something. And the, in, in, in science, we have always like, you know, people have donated tissue and blood, you know, like information to further the science, you know, like there was like the biobanks. And we don't see much problems with the biobanks, but somehow with data that's being get through, you know, especially training AI, is this becomes this huge, uh, you know, like, a, you know, problem that people are trying to, uh, you know, answer. And one thing that I think the you know, GAO, National Academies, and, you know, our legislators could help us is actually to come up with very clear guidelines, you know, that on, at least on the federal level, where should we stand, you know, and actually listen, listen to all the stakeholders, including patients, you know, clinicians, you know, like uh, companies to actually come up with the right guidelines where we can start from and not be just being fearful about the unknown. Two quick things to this question. First off, when um, what happens after the data is generated by an AI system? In most of our implementations, I actually don't think any yet has had any direct action take place, even if it's operational having a human in the loop workflow where that then prompts review by a clinical expert who then determines what the best course of action is, putting the output from the AI system into context with other information. And then to the point about privacy, this is also like a post COVID world learning for myself is distinguishing privacy from safety. So many of, um, much of what we've been doing in Durham the last six to nine months is creating space for and building new relationships with our Latinx community. And I lived in LA for five years before moving to North Carolina. North Carolina has a much higher proportion of new arrival migrants, many of them undocumented. And there is just a lack of safety. And so if someone does not feel safe like people talk about privacy preserving technologies. I think for us, there was just the aha moment of let's assume that we don't need your identifiers anywhere. They do not need to exist in any digital form, whether they're privacy preserved or not, to be able to connect you to a service. And so just trying to acknowledge the lack of safety. Unfortunately, I know that yesterday there's a big transition, but I don't think that safety issue is going to go away. And when I started digging into some of the questions I was getting, I was even troubled. I got the question over the summer of why is there ICE enforcement at hospitals in a post-COVID world? Then there has been cases. These are real things. And there was, the, of course, the controversy in the fall of CDC data then going to HHS and a new data system being used. So I think as a government, we have to really address safety before we can start to get people to trust even privacy.
I really want to echo what Mark just said. We have huge issues where we'll train a model and it just won't work on African-Americans, which is horrifying. That's, that's not okay, but we need some data, right? But in order to get African-Americans to participate in systems and allow us to use their data, I, I really don't think this is about privacy, right? Like we're, we're public researchers yeah. we're not saying we're gonna sell you a Fitbit. Yeah. Right, they're worried about their safety. Yes, and yeah, like they're worried about physical safety. Yes, am I going to be uh, harassed? Am I going to be deported? Will I have to report to a, a government agency because of my behavior? They're worried about safety, and I think that's something very different from privacy, and we should mm -hmm. definitely couple it. That, that's why I think, like when I, I agree, with both of you guys just said is like if you go back all the policies that. The GAO put in the report, you know, one of the best practices, I think that's probably one of the best we can do, you know, work all together, government, industry, academia, you know, because there is a lot of good work being done. A lot of times you just don't know. And if the GAO, for example, could facilitate something, this, it would be fantastic. Collaboration, I, best practices. I think a key here is that for certain technical problems, there needs to be non-technical solutions where the policies that we need to have in place and I think we'd be happy to talk more about those and what those would look like, but there, there's no algorithm that will fix these things. There's no algorithm that will obfuscate data to make someone feel safe if they don't feel safe to begin with. Yeah, I think those are all great points. And I think we're about at time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap things up then. And uh, just wanna say thanks again to all of our panelists uh, this would, if we were all here in person, this is the part where we, there would be thunderous applause and everyone would be cheering. You guys were great. This was really informative. Um, so I'll just ask, uh, you guys can turn your cameras off. I'm going to have the slides back up. John, quick question. Just there's so many questions. Um, do folks have our email addresses if they wanted to follow up? So we're going to send everything out at the end cool. so that people can, can stay in touch. Yeah. Thanks, though. There are indeed. Thanks, everybody. It's a pleasure. So if we get the slides up quickly, I can just uh, let everyone know that, uh, again, just a quick reminder that this is eligible for CME. If we go to the next slide. Um, and we're going to also be sending everybody the uh, slide deck as well as the recording for the event. So that'll have the information there. You don't need to try and you know scribble all this down right now. But if you're eligible, please go ahead and, and get your credits. Um, you can go to the next slide, which I don't think we need. Yep, and we can go straight to this, so perfect. Um, you know, I, I think that went really well and I was really excited about that. So what I'm gonna do now is turn things over to our friends over at the National Academy of Medicine for the second half of the webinar. So I'm honored to be able to introduce a close, close colleague and friend of mine at the National Academy of Medicine, Noor Ahmed. Noor is an Associate Program Officer with NAM and her portfolio consists of digital health and evidence generation and dissemination issues. Uh, Noor, please take it away. It was off. There we go. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so fortunate to have been part of an 11 person author team, some of whom you will hear from later during the session that developed this review of the possibilities AI holds for augmenting care outside of the hospital and clinic setting or HSOC for short. Um, this report is a companion to the GAO report that was just presented and during the next 10 minutes I'll present the highlights of our paper, which are timely given the current circumstances. Next slide please. So first to define what we mean by HSOC. So looking at the left two thirds of this diagram, it refers to settings outside of the four walls of a hospital or medical office to areas where people live, work, go to school. This also refers to new modes of care delivery, such as retail clinics and community centers that offer health adjacent supportive services. The aim is to extend care from hospitals and clinics that are traditionally considered the locus of care to where people spend most of their time and understand the context in which they live for a richer, more nuanced care delivery. Next slide, please. So what's driving this change are a number of factors. So on the left side are statistics that we all know too well. 
um, the rising cost of care in the United States compared to our peers, yet the United States lags behind in its outcomes with highest rates of suicide, disease burden, um, and even with the $3.8 trillion that we spent in 2019, 31% um, of it spent on hospital care, the U.S. ranks of high among its peers in hospitalization for preventable diseases, and that's what you're seeing on the left side. But what's interesting are the optimistic trends that we see on the right. Um, so if there's an increased focus on social determinants of health to take into consideration a person's environment and socioeconomic factors. Um, one study showed that um, investment in social determinants of health by payers reduces costs by 11%. There's also this acknowledgement of the expansive growth of mobile health devices, wearable devices, as you can see on the graph to the right shows this upward growth. Um, and with that comes the opportunity to broaden access to care, to remote and under-resourced areas, to address shortcomings, um, and to equitably and ethically uh, distribute the benefits. So although digital divide issues exist, M Health, um, you know, one of the cases is that M Health used um, among Black and Hispanic adults is the same as white adults. And so we are seeing a great opportunity here because um, many of these racial minority communities are actually using cell phones for um, health information. Um, so next slide, please. So what we really focused on is this cumulative growth of mobile health devices and consumer health products, um, along with AI that has opened the door for shifting care to the HSOC setting. Uh, so many examples we highlight in this report focus on the coupling of AI with these other digital health tools. So for receiving individual level care, we see that the most mature example on the left is AI used for supporting telehealth. And so during COVID-19, telehealth has proven to be a lifeblood for patients and clinicians to keep in touch and monitor progress. The second, um, or I should just mention before moving on, the type of AI that we use here is mainly computer vision. And computer vision is a technique that allows computers to emulate human sensory capabilities, such as vision and smell. Um, natural language processing is widely used also, and it's the ability for computers to parse and comprehend human speech and record um, and respond accordingly. Um, so examples of this um, are chatbots, um, and chatbots have been used by a number of health systems for COVID triaging. They can also be employed as scribes to capture and to jot down human speech and help clinicians with uh, keeping track of medical records and the exchange between patients. Um, so the next bucket that we see uh, on the right is the application of AI for enhancing clinical care. And this is care that is either received in the office or is to supplement the office care or um, to even act as a substitute. So in an in-person visit, when you go see a clinician or physician, the clinician gets an isolated snapshot of a person's health. Um, AI integrated with remote sensing tools, though, such as a Fitbit or an Apple Watch can provide a continuous read of a person's glucose status, for example. Um, it can also uh, provide a read of the heart rate and can detect risks of certain conditions, as we've seen with the FDA's approval of the Apple Watch for possible um, an atrial fibrillation event. So the technique of AI that is used mainly in this space are machine learning techniques, which is another subset of AI um, that uses high level computation to draw inferences between data. Um, the other thing is that we also see a growing example of blood pressure management tools. Remote blood pressure cuffs are being developed in conjunction with AI coaching tools to intervene when a blood pressure reducing strategy such as hypertension education or uh, nutrition coaching through voice or text, and can also promote medication adherence. Um, and an area that is of growing interest, and that's our third bucket, is managing mental health and well-being. A number of studies are showing the devastating and long-lasting mental toll of the pandemic. Anxiety, depression, suicides are increasing due to months of self-isolation. And so we're also seeing that the power of these remote sensing tools that can capture digital communications by voice calls and text messages, Facebook posts, Instagram posts, um, social media activity, including physical activity uh, that is gathered from your wearables um, and can be analyzed using machine learning techniques, as we discussed before, for risk identification and prediction related to mental health conditions. With mobile devices mostly powered on, 
uh, and often in the hands of the owner, these sets of tools really position mental health field to provide uh, precision medicine. And this has been a long standing goal for other clinical um, settings and for um, uh, specialties, but it is really important in this instance to deliver the right treatment at the right time to the right patient. So next slide, please. So achieving population health and a strong public health response to build is to build really on these individual level insights on a large scale using tools that we've just described for chronic diseases as they pose like a huge burden on society, individuals, and the health system. So these tools also combine social variables such as education, labor status, one's occupation, household income to really understand trends in a community. And again, we're seeing a combination of NLP, natural language processing, machine learning, uh, computer vision being used to scan various sources of data and um, make analyses. So with regard to COVID-19, we saw one great example, the Blue Dot AI program, which utilized all these sources of data in addition to flight travel patterns and social media data early on to really provide an early warning sign to the disease in December, 2019. There are other public health applications also, you know, for detecting uh, toxicity in household chemicals, as well as to measure the air quality in an environment that could be used for asthma management. Next slide. So in understanding the value AI holds for care delivery in HSOC, we have come to realize the many challenges and some of these have been already covered. Um, and they are very generalizable to all types of AI. Um, but there's some unique considerations when we're thinking about the HSOC environment and who the users are and what sort of data is being used. So you'll notice the first uh, three being data. Um, and data is very prominent because of course, it's no surprise that data is the foundation of AI. So with regard to AI tools, especially coupled with consumer technologies, the lack of data standards to meaningfully integrate the data with clinical data and make it actionable, but not to overwhelm the clinician and consumer poses a big challenge. It also poses undue burden on AI developers to clean and standardize that data as we heard from in the previous panel. Um, and that data is really important in, in terms of feeding it back into the algorithm and refining and making adjustments. Um, so the paper talks about a few ongoing efforts such as fire resources, Odyssey, that are efforts that are trying to structure and wrangle da healthcare data, but we're just not there yet. Um, the second bucket is, of course, privacy issues, and it's been a longstanding um, topic. It's complicated by the fact in this arena that the data is, most of it is captured from mHealth apps and use um, AI. Uh, so. AI, which is used to help build upon health related data. And so most of this is not um, is either um, sourced by entities, AI entities, developers that are not HIPAA compliant, wearable tech companies are also not HIPAA compliant, uh, excuse me, not HIPAA covered. So these non HIPAA entity non covered HIPAA entities therefore don't need to obtain individual authorization. Um, so broader protections for data are needed acknowledging that the range of health data that exists and there need to be unified protections because some classes of data are governed by different sets of rules and many of these rules are fragmented between different sets of data. The next bucket of course is bias um, and algorithmic and data bias. And it is important to really have a representative database. So these tools can be more useful for communities that need them most. And that is really what we're trying to establish and achieve with um, AI tools in HSOC. So we'll be discussing in the next panel discussion, some specific examples and the consequences of, um, of bias being introduced into a system. Digital health tools um, are also evolving and adoption among consumers is working at, is growing at a rapid pace. So um, with clinical adoption still lagging for these tools to offer care continuity and care access, they must be recognized and AI including as the tools that they deliver value, they can drive down costs and improve outcomes. And so they must be reimbursed and covered accordingly. Um, however, there are still some concerns regarding the accuracy of machine learning algorithms, and so that does affect liability and uh, coverage recognition. Uh, we talk about in the paper the variability of results specific to the Apple and Huawei 
cardiac tools. Um, and these questions about reliability have raised safety concerns. Um, and as I mentioned, liability concerns that has come up quite a bit in our conversations. And so with both safety and, rely and liability issues as it relates to transparency, they have to be balanced. And a broad safety framework needs to be developed developed to ensure patient trust and confidence in these tools. And it goes beyond the jurisdiction of the FDA. Uh, so for example, consumer grade wearables and at-home monitoring devices, um, when they are marketed as general well wellness devices lie outside of the FDA's jurisdiction. And we'll be discussing that a little bit more in our panel discussion. Um, and the liability landscape needs to be better understood to really understand the boundaries of where liability falls, uh, whether it is sometimes, you know, if there is an, um, a consequence or an, a, an adverse reaction, where it falls within the health system or the developer or um, the consumer itself. So next slide. So I wanna thank my fantastic collaborators here on this project. Um, and I wanna turn it over to our panel discussion that's gonna be led by one of them. Uh, Sonu Tadani Israni is the executive director of the Stanford Presence Center and will be leading a discussion with uh, four other co-authors. Thank you so much. Thank you, Noor. Good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to first introduce the panelists who will be joining me on this panel, starting with Dr. Michael Matheny, who's a practicing general internist and a board certified clinician informatician and co-director of the Vanderbilt University's Center for Improving the Public's Health with Informatics. His research foci are predictive analytics, data modeling, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, automated medical device surveillance, and natural language processing. Second, we have Dr. John Curtin, who's a professor of psychology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he also serves as the director of clinical training and the director of addiction research. His program of for research focuses on the use of personal sensing and machine learning techniques for psychiatric diagnosis and risk protections, precision medicine, and just-in-time interventions for substance use and other psychiatric disorders. Third, we have Dr. Sanjay Basu, who's a practicing internal medicine physician and the director of research at the Center for Primary Care at Harvard Medical School and the vice president of research and population health at Collective Health. His work has focused on addressing social determinants of health, primary care workforce and financing, and the development and validation of tools for improving population health. Last, but certainly not least, is Dr. Barbara Evans, who's a professor of law and professor of engineering at the University of Florida. She has expertise in biotechnology, law, data, privacy and access, and regulation of artificial intelligence and machine learning, medical software, among other topics. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for being part of the team that co-authored the paper that Noor gave an excellent summary of. We don't have a ton of time. So the first thing I'm gonna to say to our audience is many of the questions that you're asking through the Q&A are answered if you would read the papers authored by both the NAM group as well as the GAO team. So if we don't get to all your questions, please consider reading those. I'd actually like to start with both uh, Michael and Sanjay, if I may, and focus on um, the world of unintended consequences. Is there a particular story or instance that you can recount that illustrates how racial or socioeconomic bias and, and AI algorithms negatively impacted real life patient care or outcomes? Do you think that are these unique situations in health settings outside hospitals and clinics where AI could be more susceptible to those sort of biases compared to hospital and clinic settings? Michael, may I start with you, please? And thank you. And I just uh, want to thank the organizers of the webinar for the opportunity to come and speak. Um, you know, I, I think the, the one I do a lot of uh, work in public health and population health. And the one that stands out to me um, that was a real cautionary tale was the um, work that was published in 2019 in Science uh, around 
um, an algorithm that was uh, built uh, by a large uh, uh, healthcare uh, uh, claims organization um, to help uh, their network sort of assess people that were at high risk for uh, complications and uh, and to try to basically identify them in a population health framework and help uh, uh, sort of invite them in for additional care, additional uh, clinic visits, and other uh, things. And what they what they found, which was a uh, you know um, you know predictable but completely unintentional on, on their part was they used an outcome of uh, healthcare expenditures or healthcare costs as their as their target outcome as their training and what that what happened uh, in that result is that um, you know because white patients were getting uh, more healthcare care cost utilization for a given level of uh, clinical severity than um, you know black and other minority patients um, they found that essentially it was uh, in further increasing priority for the white patients and decreasing priority for the black patients and African Americans to get additional health care um, and what they did is they it was a I, I love this story not only because of the cautionary tale but because of what happened. So they contacted the company, the company was very open with them, worked with them to um, evaluate different outcomes in different ways to redesign the data frames and the feature space and actually show that if you pivoted the outcome to, uh, you know, to the severity of chronic illness in the population instead of healthcare cost expenditures, that they were able to adjust out 80% of the systemic racial bias in the algorithm and showed that they were able to actually, uh, that if they implemented the new algorithm, it would uh, have drastically changed the proportion of, um, of African-American patients that received additional care. And so, you know, it's both a cautionary tale for us and I think a way that those of us in academia and industry and, and in government can really work together proactively to help try to fix these algorithms iteratively over time. Thanks, Michael. You bring up a great point, which has been brought up in the last panel and in the papers as well is, Hindsight can be 2020, but given this cautionary tale, engage that diverse group of stakeholders to think through the algorithms that are built, both in terms of the framing, but also in terms of data and other things. Thanks, Michael. Sanjay, what would you add to that, if anything? Uh, and, and thank you to, the, to you and the other organizers for having this webinar. I think the example I chose is, um, Complementary to Michael's, it involves a heart disease risk algorithm that physicians use in order to help determine whether to prescribe statins to patients. And several years ago, the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association produced an update with great intentions. They started to finally incorporate some cohorts of African American adults in addition to the classical Framingham and similar primarily white adult populations. Ironically, the effort resulted in a risk score that can give you bizarre results for African American adults because it was overfitting a small amount of data. And so in clinic, we could see that a patient who is somewhat obviously at high risk for a myocardial infarction or stroke with somebody with diabetes or smoking or other risk factors would often be given an artificially low score uh, simply because of that overfitting process. A revised score in this case has been uh, proposed, but hasn't been adopted widely. Uh, sort of to Michael's point, uh, there hasn't been a broad enough set of attention to this issue to yet uh, result in convergence on a, on a revised score. So I think it remains a cautionary tale today. Thanks, Sanjay. And you know, each time I ask a question, I'll ask a couple on the panel, but I leave it open to others to jump in if you have other uh, things to add. So John and Barbara, anything to add to that or? We can move on. Great, so moving from unintended consequences, I'd like to shift the, the questioning more to domains of healthcare that have benefited from the increased use of AI. So uh, John, maybe we can start with you to ask, in your opinion, are there currently any missed opportunities or low hanging fruit for AI in what we're calling HSOC, which is health settings outside the hospital and clinic that could be applied readily and be impactful, certain aspects of the realities of COVID-19 right now, or retail clinics, or public health, or mental health? Great, thank you, Sonia. Um, yeah, I mean, so I was the uh, mental health care expert on the team, and so that's where my mind immediately turns. And <clears throat> there are certainly important opportunities for the 
development and refinement of AI powered apps to provide continuing or aftercare support for patients in recovery from substance use disorders. So in the US, we do an okay job of assisting patients with substance use disorders that become initially abstinent. We have short-term inpatient programs, intensive day treatment programs, outpatient programs, and, and they typically succeed in assisting patients to establish abstinence. But uh, substance use disorders are chronic relapsing disorders, and we do a horrible job at providing continuing care long-term. And this really presents as a really serious and, and really costly public health concern. And so there's, there's great opportunity for AI-powered mHealth apps that are accessible through smartphones to play an important role here. And, and as an example, I'll give an example here from the Center for Health Enhancement System Studies at the University of Wisconsin. And so we've developed and evaluated such an app for continuing care support for substance use disorders. And to give you a sense of the richness that it can offer, it has medication and appointment managers. It can help identify AA and NA groups with where they are and when they're meeting. It provides social support via discussion groups um, with others struggling with SUDs. It has healthy and healthy events calendar to support patients committing to increasing positive rewarding activities in their lives, provides digital interventions such as guided mindfulness meditation, guided relaxation for stress reduction, um, limited forms of cognitive behavioral therapy that can be provided digitally. It, it even has a clinician dashboard that can be activated if there is clinical aftercare support in place to allow for bi-directional communication and patient monitoring. And so you know, already um, it's a wonderful tool, but it's a, a tool that actually um, can, well, let me say that I mean, it's a wonderful tool and there's actually substantial evidence that it's uh, actually quite effective. So for example, there was a recent uh, randomized controlled trial that um, demonstrated that the app cut heavy drinking days in half and increased point prevalence abstinence by about 15% over a year versus treatment as usual. And of course, treatment as usual for continuing care is, is, is relatively weak. Um, but critically, the, these apps can still get smarter in at least two ways by incorporating AI algorithms combined with personal sensing. And so if that term personal sensing isn't familiar with you, it's something that presents a lot of opportunity outside the healthcare setting. And so what it involves really is, is picking up or monitoring all the digital breadcrumbs that we drop throughout our lives day to day. Smartphones can monitor our geoposition through GPS services. They have access to our cellular communications, our voice and SMS logs, our SMS content. Uh, you can push out uh, brief questions to smartphones that patients can answer periodically throughout the day. Uh, they can be connected to sleep sensors in the bed. Um, and you can use all, all of these sorts of longitudinal person sense, personal sensing signals to um, do one of a couple of different things that are really quite, quite powerful. One, you can do risk prediction. And so th this is the work that my lab does with these signals. You know, we've, uh, we're, we've been working on developing a model to predict future lapses back to alcohol use among patients who are in recovery from alcohol use disorders and more recently, patients with opioid use disorder as well. And we can already predict with 95% accuracy uh, whether or not someone who's in recovery and who's abstinent from alcohol will drink on a subsequent day into the future using data from their past from this monitoring. And so when you, when you have a risk prediction signal like that, you can feed that back to the patient to alert them to something that's challenging for them, the, what substance use disorders provide or, or require is constant lifelong monitoring. And so with this monitoring system in place, patients can be alerted to uh, degradations in the integrity of their recovery. Um, and similarly, clinicians, if, if connected through the dashboard, can use a signal like this to monitor who among their large caseload might be most in need of further support and so you can have efficient resource allocation as well. Um, these signals can also be used for treatment recommendations as well. And so, you know, the app itself is primarily designed to uh, provide intervention support, um, but there are lots and lots of tools and services, but by monitoring which of these signals are 
contributing to increasing risk, we can start to recommend back to the patient what they should be doing as well. And so if the risk is because there's changes in their social network, it appears from cellular communications, from GPS signal, that they're interacting more with a former uh, drug or alcohol using peers rather than their healthy network. They can be directed to reconnect to AA to engage in more healthy activities with, with their supportive peer groups. If their signals that indicate poor sleep or high stress, they can be directed towards the guided relaxation or the mindfulness interventions. And so, um, you know, by powering these apps with AI, we can start to both identify times of great need intervene just in time and also potentially intervene with the appropriate uh, interventions at that time. Um, I should also end by noting that the potential impact of these mobile health apps is really increased for at least a few reasons. First, they're really massively scalable in a cost efficient way. For the most part, they're automated. And so a, a patient can carry this around in their pocket without the need for additional clinician support in the moment. Um, I mean, they they're used best when they're connected with, with ongoing clinical care, but most of the support is available on your phone. And that means that it's available regardless of where you are. So we can get penetration into rural settings where healthcare services often aren't available and you can get 24 seven access. One of the challenges in the mental health care space is mo most of these interventions are done um, you know, in a time limited fashion. You meet with your therapist once a week or once a month for your hour. And now we have access to these interventions 24 seven. And then finally, you know, to address the COVID piece, um, you know, I mean, I, I think we're all aware that, that COVID has substantially increased the need for mental health services in, in our country right now. The, the stresses have really exacerbated existing and produced new mental health problems and similarly increased problems with, with alcohol and substance use disorders as well. And at the same time, removed, removed a lot of the traditional mental health care support that was provided in person. And so apps like these really present a great opportunity to address those sorts of needs as well. Um, so re really excited about that domain and these applications. Thanks, John. You point out how the COVID, with all its cruelties, caused constraints, and those constraints then forced innovation. And uh, a piece I will observe, as you've heard me observe many times, is the challenge of what you just pointed out and laid out is it works very well for people who have the privilege of technology and the privilege of being on one side of the digital divide. I'm actually going to turn to Barbara before I turn to Sanjay and Michael, for examples, uh, to have Barbara perhaps weigh in on some of the legal and uh, uh, ethical considerations of using data to reinforce behaviors and in, whether it's mental health or anything else. Barbara, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, the example that John gave shows the enormous power of this technology, but also validates the reason people have privacy concerns someone's tracking who I'm hanging around with and whether I'm with a good crowd or a bad crowd uh, under uh, our major privacy regulations like HIPAA, law enforcement can get my data without my consent if they follow certain procedures. And so you understand the, the depth of privacy concerns people have about this. And that uh, is crucial because we're at a place now with this AI technology becoming part of our health ecosystem. And I don't just mean in the clinic, but public health, population health, research, where we can make great strides if we do this, but um, there will be a reluctance um, unless we can provide a more credible privacy protection framework than we ever have before. And what makes it so critical is this question of bias. Uh, that these systems uh, are leaving out people who do not have large access to health care. Um, and in some sense, that's not, you know, bias is not a problem of AI. It's a problem of the surrounding healthcare system. Ultimately, to repair AI and make it unbiased, we have to make sure everybody has access not only to health care, but to the 
first rate healthcare occurring in academic medical centers that have the resources to do AI research. And uh, not everybody has that. And um, it seems unfair to, to blame that on AI. The problem is we need to get our healthcare access sorted out in a way we have not yet done. Um, but that may take a while. And also, I, I think we're justified in saying we want these new, new systems coming on to be better than the healthcare system they're coming into. And we have to solve bias, but that means solving privacy. Right now, we have this very primitive privacy framework that relies on consent as its only privacy protection, which doesn't really protect your data. Uh, to protect privacy, you need things like privacy by design, you need restrictions on downstream uses of data and sharing, uh, things other than whether someone consented. And then to get around the consent, we built AI systems that um, use de-identified data. Well, when you strip the identifiers off, including zip codes, you lose the ability to audit whether the system is representative of the entire population. Uh, so unless we can audit, detect, and call out the bias in the training data sets and the operational data sets, we're never going to fix that. And to do that, we need a different privacy framework that will let us retain identifiers to the extent needed to detect bias in the systems. Um, to a large degree, and this is my last point, whether people are properly reflected in these AI tools, you know, whether their group of, you know, whether women, whether it's a racial group, whether we're adequately reflected uh, is beyond our control. It depends on our healthcare access to a large degree, but it is somewhat in our control. And uh, I think we need an education effort. Uh, people have, uh, I think just, we're all concerned about privacy and we've become very reluctant to share our data uh, and, and skeptical of it. But we need for people to understand that even if you feel traumatized by uses of your data, perhaps because of historical bias in research or historical injustices, even if you feel that way, you need to realize that unless you share your data, these important tools are not going to be helpful to you and to people like you. So we need to uh, message to people that there is a cost to privacy if it uh, boils down to refusing to let your data be used uh, because uh, you need to be in there to be reflected and to get unbiased results. I'll pause there and invite others, but uh, I think that we need new laws, basically. We're in a different era and the laws we did in the 1970s will hold us back. Thank you, Barbara. I think you point out astutely that the challenges that we have a society that has its historical challenges around inequity and the lack of justice. And it's about fixing that underlying situation. And as many of you know, the center that I run here at Stanford called Presence very much focuses on the humans in the system, which connects to the last mile discussion that Mark Sendak brought up in the last panel, where we can't forget that healthcare in the end is being given to humans and the humans around them, which is their friends and family. It is being given by humans, physicians, clinicians, other support system, et cetera. Um, and all of which lives within a society with its own lack of uh, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, switching to Sanjay. Sanjay, examples of opportunities in the eight shock world as it relates to say COVID management or something else, public health related? One of the points that I have been thinking about with regard to that question is how to properly account for payers in this space. So even though we're talking about healthcare outside of clinic and hospital, many of us have derived our foundations from clinic and hospital and are now reaching community and in that sense, need to be aware of our own biases 
uh, in interacting with people who have the opposite orientation, those who are starting from community and now are interacting with healthcare. So in that context, I feel like a lot of the challenges we see is who is going to pay for services in the home or in the community that are not naturally oriented towards our most predominantly fee-for-service um, healthcare system. It's really interesting to see how much more uh, Medicare and CMS have been advancing along this route rather than private payers. For example, Medicare now recently reimbursing hospital at home programs that provide um, monitoring for people in rural or other areas or during COVID, people who are in areas where the hospital is full but need to be monitored for oxygenation and other vital signs remotely. Medicare will pay, but most commercial insurers have yet to pay. Uh, despite the randomized trials demonstrating both safety and actually surprising to me improvements in outcomes, which in retrospect may not be that surprising given reduction in delirium and hospital acquired infections and so on. So I wonder how we can be cognizant of particularly engaging healthcare payers to pay outside of the healthcare space or someone else to fund the work uh, because the implementation in practice by community-based organizations requires funds, particularly when some of those who are trying in the public health space are very constrained and the idea of applying AI to them seems like a luxury or a fanciful future idea when our public health system is currently struggling with, um, what, frankly, what others are doing much better as we see right now um, with vaccination and contact tracing and so on. So I would suggest we um, pay some further attention to how we might incorporate payers and how we might incorporate funders into this in order to support the community-based initiatives to improve health outside of the hospital and clinic environment. Thanks, thanks, Anjay. Michael, what would you add? Um, yeah, I think- To this I, opportunity mm -hmm. of- mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but I, you know, I'd really like to highlight the, the, uh, the opportunity space of, um, you know, self management and self diagnosis along the lines of what uh, John mentioned in mental health, but I think, you know, it applies to many domains, you know, you've got the glu uh, self uh, continuous glucose monitors hooked to insulin pumps for diabetic, you've got skin lesion detection from somebody that, you know, is using an app at home to sort of see like, what's that weird thing on their on their hand and, you know, you have applications from like the one lead Apple watch. Um, in fact, one of our co-authors on the uh, chapter, uh, Rashmi Shah is doing research about the impact of all of these tools in the community. And as they generate um, medically relevant diagnostic uh, information, you know, how do you interface that back into healthcare proper? Um, how do you improve everyone's healthcare while still sort of managing the workflows both in and outside of the healthcare? And so I think it's a tremendous opportunity. I think COVID is an interesting story that uh, COVID sort of highlighted, I think, public education that needs to happen. The Apple uh, One Lead EKG watch also has a function on it for pulse oximetry, which became, you know, suddenly in the public uh, discussion space, you know, given that COVID uh, has a syndrome where you are hypoxic and you don't really uh, feel hypoxic. Um, and so a lot of people started using that. Well, the Apple, the One Lead EKG function is FDA approved. The pulse ox is uh, classed as entertainment. And so I, a lot of consumers didn't understand the difference, didn't see the, the so I think there's education issues, there's, um, there's a tremendous opportunity for basically deploying healthcare diagnostics and maintenance and self-management out in the community with, uh, with these AI tools. So. Thanks, Michael. And as you well know, um, even the regular pulse oximeter's ability to give accurate readings for people with darker skin is worse. Back to disparities. <laughs> And lack of equity. Yeah. Um, the skin, uh, uh, the skin detection, skin lesion have similar problems as well. Some of the imaging. True, true. Um, you know, so a common refrain that we've heard from our last panel, the papers that we all co-authored, co etc., has to do with garbage in, garbage out. It's only as good as the data. So, what considerations? do you think should be given around data collection, especially when it relates to vulnerable populations, uh, children, minors? Um, John, perhaps we can start with you and then move to the others, including Barbara. Sure. 
So, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to like to try to connect a few different themes that are coming through here. I mean, for, first, you know, th this issue of privacy and trust has, has come up. And I want to offer one observation there first before I dig into how, how do we get data to resolve some of these issues. You know, we've been struck that at least in when we've worked with unselected samples of patients with alcohol use disorders, patients with substance use disorders, patient and then individuals in the youth community to do either like risk prediction for relapse risk, or we've done some work using, for example, Facebook to do um, diagnostic screening for alcohol use disorders and substance use disorders. We've been struck by uh, how willing people are to share their data. Uh, and it's been, we collect probably the most sensitive data there are. As I said, we monitor geolocation. People give us their full access to their um, cellular and SMS logs and their SMS content. Uh, in the study where we're doing diagnostic work, people give us full access to their public and private facing Facebook information, all their direct messaging. And, and you know, it's been surprising there to us initially, because I mean, part of this initial work was, would this be possible? Would people trust us? And we've been, you know, surprised that they have. And that is not in any way um, to take away from, I completely agree with Barbara, that, you know, people trust us. I don't know that they should, because I don't know that the protections are in place. I mean, I mean, we as researchers have protections in place, certificates of confidentiality to you know, to at least protect against or diminish the likelihood of data getting subpoenaed. Um, but, you know, were these, when these apps are released into the real world, I, I think privacy and protection concerns are paramount. I said, I started that with saying um, unselected samples because our, our work now is pushing in to try to tune these apps to work with communities of color. And also, as Barbara said, we need data from participants, patients of color, if these apps and these algorithms are going to work with those communities. And I think it's critical that we attend to at least three separate issues there. We, well, A, we need data from those communities and we've already heard examples here and I think we're all aware of other examples where algorithms don't work if you don't have diverse samples that for which they're trained on. Um, but in order to get individuals from communities of color to participate, you, you, you have to be actively thinking about it and working on it. And so in the work that we're doing right now, for example, we've uh, partnered with um, Alex G, he's a nationally prominent um, black pastor and, and activist, and, and he happens to, uh, be, to live in Madison. And so we're working with his community center uh, in a variety of ways. We went to him and humbly asked first and foremost, what does what does your community need? We, we don't even know what they need in the start and for us to impose our perspective on what they need would be would be you know short-sighted. And so we started partnering with them just getting a sense of what the community needs. How could these apps address concerns in the community? And then we partnered with them um, hiring their staff to do participant recruiting for us to, to uh, do onboarding for us. And that, that's there to build trust in the community. Um, and so I, I think you need partners in the community if you're gonna build that trust. Um, and then the, the teams that are doing the work have to include scientists and modelers of color on the development teams. I mean, again, if, if it was me, just a white scientist doing this, I have major blind spots that um, that won't allow me to even know what I don't know. And so we, we have to work hard to have diverse development teams as well as connections into these uh, communities of color if we're going to be able to collect these data to build algorithms that actually can serve these communities of color. And so, I mean, that's something that we're thinking about really carefully these days. Great points, John. Uh, the idea of humility about engaging people who have different experiences and lenses to bring to the discussion. Uh, and then this idea of partnership versus I'm here to get A, B, and C from you so I can use it for X, Y, and Z. Um, Barbara, what would you add to that? You're muted. Barbara, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. 
is um, this, you know, data collected in research settings are obviously very important, but ultimately we need to be capturing data in regular routine healthcare settings too. And what I think sometimes isn't understood that much more is involved in that than just grabbing the data. It takes an enormous amount of personnel effort to put the data in a consistent format, common data model, help when the it's not clear, what does it really say? And it's really a big ask to uh, have community healthcare centers that are already burdened heavily and trying to provide care to people who are not receiving enough care to say, now we want you to do all of this uh, data curating. And ultimately, uh, this is an infrastructure problem. Uh, we don't think of it that way, but uh, previously in our nation's history at various points, we decided we need railroads, we need power grids, we, and we built infrastructure. We did it with private capital, but regulated it to create incentives. Uh, the discussion of regulation that's happening around AI is consumer safety regulation, sort of should FDA do this or that. Uh, we need to be having a conversation about infrastructure regulation. Uh, we can use private capital and private companies to build data commons and to make these investments in curating data and make it inclusive but there needs to be an economic framework that says, if you build a data commons, it better not be discriminatory. Everybody better be in it, just the way the phone company can't say, we're not gonna give you phone service because of your color. Uh, we need infrastructure regulation and we're not going to get this done unless we think much more broadly about the regulatory scheme that's needed uh, to encompass not just FDA's role, but many, many other state and federal entities and private bodies that need to be thinking big about this. Thank you, Barbara. I'm afraid we've run out of time. So I will end with a summary, which I think is of my, one of my favorite quotes from Yuval Noah Harari, where he says, humans were always far greater at building technology versus using it wisely. And I hope that the work of the team here, as well as the GEO team, has given our audience and stakeholders an opportunity to reflect on what it means to build and use this technology wisely. Thank you all very much. I'm going to turn it over back to Karen and Michael to wrap up for the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanu. Karen, um, do you have some uh, closing observations uh, for folks? Sure, I, I'm very grateful for this discussion. It's been very interesting and informative. I truly appreciate the wide variety of perspectives our panelists brought to the discussion. And I'm uh, thankful as well for the many participants across the country who were listening and, and joining with us in this discussion. Thank you for all of the great questions in the Q&A box. A lot of good food for thought there. Michael? Yes, thank you, Karen. I'd like to underscore uh, your um, your observations. I'll make three brief comments. Um, uh, first, it's very clear that um, the progress uh, um, at hand is, is impressive, is substantial, and is inspiring. Whether we're talking about the potential for uh, the uh, application of uh, AI, machine learning to activities within the clinic or outside the clinic, uh, we had some very um, enlightening um, and, and insightful reflections from this uh, terrific panel, um, or, or both these panels. Um, secondly, or, or related to that though, we had some important observations about uh, the challenges that we face, uh, the challenges related to the socialization, the challenges related to the social circumstances the challenges related to the real world, the challenges related to the last mile uh, to, to pick up on Mark's term. So uh, th that brings me to the second point, and, and that is that it seems uh, that um, uh, while we're as enthusiastic, inspired, and encouraged by the technical prospects, it really is all about people. 
uh, and whether we're working to build uh, the uh, uh, the capacity of AI interfaces with services in a fashion that will help those services sing on behalf of uh, better health and health care. Um, uh, 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 we, we need to ensure that people are very much involved in the development process and, and um, they're, they're um, the starting points uh, f uh, for uh, for the building process, and when it comes to applying um, these technologies uh, and working for uh, to play to people's comfort zones, um, again, uh, progress the rate limiting factor is going to be the extent to which we have failed in our engaging people at at, at every step of the way, so that. Um, so that when we do have a population for which using these technologies uh, is a personal use that they are in charge of, and not just one that is uh, imposed on them, whether uh, in, uh, in, in fact or, or in impression, uh, that uh, we're going to be challenged uh, uh, with, um, with the progress, uh, achieving the progress as possible. So in a very efficient uh, manner, um, all of you uh, ha uh, as leaders in the field uh, have underscored some of the key uh, opportunities and challenges um, that uh, we can take action on, which is the third point I wanted to make. And that is, um, we're, this is the starting point for us. Um, uh, it's a snapshot in time of where we are. Uh, uh, both as a society and uh, with respect to the NAM and the uh, GAO's uh, engagement and leadership. The questions that you have asked as participants have been spectacular. Uh, and uh, we're gonna do what we can to ensure that we use those questions uh, to build upon uh, the agenda. And uh, in that same vein, we would love to have uh, your uh, your ongoing suggestions about how we can improve the prospects. Uh, what is it that we can do that will help um, increase the comfort level within, uh, among individuals and among society uh, for the progress that, uh, that we have at hand? And so please do uh, be in touch um, at, at, at any time with us. I think that the contact points uh, are illustrated in the slide uh, and we look forward very much to the follow-up. So again, thank you to Karen and colleagues. Thank you to um, the panelists and thank you to the audience uh, for not only for being with us here, but for continuing with us on the journey. Enjoy. <laughs>